48% of the Muslim in the United States of America believe that they are Muslim first, they are American second. Our purpose is to change this culture because they're infidel and what they're doing is not pleasing to Allah and we are the soldier of Allah who will make them do it. Kamal Salim was born in Lebanon to a devout Muslim family. As early as four years old, he remembers sitting at the kitchen table while his mother taught him about the Quran and his duty to Allah and Jihad. From my childhood, my mom said, one day you'll be a martyr, my son. You will die for the sake of Allah and you will exalt Islam. She said, if you kill a Jew, my son, but your hand will light up before the throne of Allah and the host of heaven will celebrate what you have done. Kamal was seven when his parents sent him to Muslim training camps to learn to use weapons and engage and kill the enemy. The boys were also taught another, more subtle form of warfare. We were training for what's called culture jihad, which is shifting cultures. Culture jihad is, it's unlike the sword, unlike the rifle, it is the jihad that will come into your world. By his 20s, Kamal was chosen to wage cultural jihad on America. In Islam, uh, liberty, freedom, monarchy, all these are idols and these must be brought down. So the liberty that you have in the United States of America, it's, it's anti-Islam, you know, so America must be changed. So I moved to the Bible Belt specifically. The Bible Belt was the strongest of the strongest. Uh, that's where the, uh, the stout Christians are. And I want to take on the best of the best because I considered myself as, as a sword of Islam. I thought I'm anointed, I'm unique, I'm selected. I'm coming to a country and a culture to change it and I have the power of Allah with me. In the early 1980s, Kamal entrenched himself in a small Midwestern town. He began targeting men from poor neighborhoods to recruit them to the Muslim faith. But one afternoon, his life would be in the hands of those he hated the most. I was going from one place to another to do a recruitment, and that day I had a car wreck. The car wreck was so severe, I ejected out of my car, landed on my neck, broke my neck in two places. This man came running to me, and he said, don't worry, we're going to take care of you, and everything's going to be all right. The ambulance came and picked me up. And now I go to the hospital, the orthopedic surgeon in the emergency room looked at my chart and he just said, son, we are going to take care of you and everything's going to be all right. The second day I wake up in the hospital and this uh, physical therapy, head of physical therapy come and read my chart and he turned around and he said the same thing word for word. We are going to take care of you. At first, Kamal was frightened by their words because these men were all Christians. You see, in terrorism, if they said, we're going to take care of you, you'd better run. Surgeries to repair Kamal's broken neck were successful, but recovery would take weeks. After being discharged from the hospital, he would need someone to care for him while he recuperated. Kamal had no one. So the orthopedic surgeon opened up his own home to this stranger. In his home, they put me in the choicest room, in the most beautiful thing. I became like part of their family. They didn't see me any difference. And now they have a basket set for Kamal. They put in money to free my bills from the hospital. Kamal was overwhelmed with the outpouring of Christian love. As he recovered, he began to help out around the house with cooking and cleaning. They have Jewish friends, they came from Israel, that they support, you know. And now I'm hugging Israelis and I'm cooking for Jews. I'm going, what has happened to me? When Kamal was able to take care of himself and return to his apartment, the doctor had another surprise for him. He said, this is the keys to the house, and here's an extra key, this is your new car. We just want to bless you. You can come anytime you want. So I go to my home, and I go to my cold place that I have been there in months, and dust is this thick. And I just got to settle this issue with my God, to know that if, if it's real or not. So I walk inside, I shut the door, I go right in the eastern window and I fall on my knees and I put my hands to the heavens and I cry up to my God, Allah, Allah my Lord and my King, why have you done such a thing to me? I'm okay with the, with the car wreck, I'm okay with all this, but why did you put me among Christians? I'm confused. These Christians and Jews, they are, they're good people, there's nothing wrong with them. They don't want to kill us. They're not the same thing that I learned about them. 
Allah, these people have relationship with their God. These people, they cry out to the God and they answer them. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear you love me. If you're real, speak to me. I want to hear your voice. Guess what Allah said that day? Absolutely nothing. Kamal felt that because he questioned his faith, the honorable thing to do was to end his own life. So I went to reach out my guns and put it in the right place and clock out. I heard the voice. The voice knew me by name. He said, Kamal, 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 why don't you call on God of Father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? And now I fell on my knees and I put my hands to the heavens immediately as I heard the voice and I cried out with every fiber within me. God the Father Abraham, if you are real, would you speak to me? God the Father Abraham, if you are real, I want to know you. Well, God of Father Abraham came to a room and he filled the room with his glory and his name was Yahweh. The Lord is one. In his hand, he has holes in his hand. He has holes in his feet. His name is Jesus. I said to him, who are you, my Lord? Who are you? He said, I am that I am. I said, I'm a simple man with a simple mind. What is that supposed to mean? He said, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am everything that is in between. I have known you before I formed the foundation of the earth. I have loved you before I formed you in your mother womb. Rise up. Rise up, come on. Kum. You are my warrior. You are not their warrior. And I said to him, I said, my Lord, my Lord, I will live and die for you. He said, do not die for me. I died for you that you may live. That day, instead of taking his life, Kamal gave it to Jesus. He now has a new mission and travels the country challenging Muslims to question their allegiance to Allah. My heart desire is to reach out for my brothers and sisters, the Muslim out there, 1.5 billion Muslim, that they are living out there and they have not tasted freedom and that freedom in God. It's been over 20 years since Kamal left the Islamic faith and even threats of violence and death cannot stop him from sharing his story. He is real. You know, and if you never experienced God before in your life, if you never tasted God, and if you think you got nothing to lose, when, when you're sitting in your home, whether you're a Muslim or, or a non-Muslim or a non-Christian or whatever you are, say, call on God of Father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and say, if you are real, speak to me, I want to hear your voice. When I was growing up, um, to be a drug dealer was a prosperous position. You were honored. As a teenager on the streets of Buffalo, New York, Guy Ionello hung out with gangs and experimented with drugs. Drugs were just pills at first, and then it went to marijuana, and then it escalated and, and got bigger and bigger, and the drugs became more of a friend to me than anything else. Guy joined the Navy in 1972. Instead of straightening up, he fell even deeper into the world of drugs. At that period of time, I got into drugs very heavily, especially in the military. In fact, I got involved in a, uh, a group of individuals, civilian and military individuals, that were involved in the drug world, and it really escalated my drug abuse uh, to where at one time I was uh, shot at and almost killed. When he left the military, Guy became a full-time drug dealer but he was arrested in the biggest cocaine bust Western New York had ever seen. So at the age of around 20, 21, I was sentenced to prison for life. After serving only a year and a half of his life sentence, Guy was paroled. He married an old acquaintance, Kate. He started a limo service and several other businesses, most of which he used to traffic drugs. Guy made a lot of money but there was a price. It was always the fear, always having to turn around, always having to look behind you to know, always being concerned whether phones were tapped, you know, they were always wondering if you were gonna get shot and killed during a drug deal. Along with Guy's paranoia came an increasing addiction to drugs. Soon it was more than Kate could stand, so she left. Eventually, drugs cost Guy everything he ever had and more. 
All the money I had, I went through. I was actually in my own home that was in foreclosure with no running water, no electricity, no money, taking showers outside of hoses and eating where I could eat and taking sneakers out of garbage cans. I had no life. My only exit was death. I got to a point where I actually slipped my wrist to try and kill myself because I could not no longer live that life. I, I wanted to stop using it and I couldn't. No matter what I tried, programs or anything, I, I couldn't stop. Guy was arrested again for drug possession. He was out on bail when he ran into an old friend who invited Guy to church. I thought, well, what do I got to lose? I've tried everything else. Later that afternoon, the service was still on Guy's mind. That preacher said, just ask Jesus. So I sat up and I said, you know, God, I know you're out there somewhere. I know you're out there somewhere. I believe you're out there somewhere. I've been brought up that way to believe that there's a God, but I don't know you. And I said, you know what? I began to weep and cry and I go, I began to repent. I said, you know how many people I've hurt? I said, I'm sorry. How many families have destroyed? How many people I killed by selling them drugs or, or causing money to go on a, into a place where somebody was murdered or whatever? And, and it just began to affect me terribly. And I began to weep and cry. And I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for everything I've ever done. And I said, Jesus, please take this life over and come into this heart. Take me. All of a sudden, this love started filling me and filling me. And it was overwhelming me. And I began to discern or compare that this love was everything I've been looking for through drugs, alcohol, women, power, money. And I realized, wait a minute, it's you. It's you I've been looking for this whole time. You. Guy couldn't wait to tell everyone he knew about his encounter with Christ. He even flew out to tell his ex-wife. Kate couldn't believe the change. I saw the same person in human form, but he was entirely different in every other way. He was just so alive, I, I saw what born again really meant. The change Kate saw in Guy prompted her to make her own decision to accept Christ. I was in the New Age just really looking for a supernatural God. If God was God, he could still do supernatural things. And I didn't find him in the supernatural uh, through the New Age, but when I saw Guy, changed totally. I knew that anything that could change that man was the God that I was looking for. While Guy was a changed man, his past was still on trial. When he went back to court, they ignored my life sentence. And, a, and here I had a mandatory minimum four years to do. I walked out of the courtroom with probation and no longer went to prison. Within two months, Guy and Cage remarried. Now I'm a pastor of a church. Uh, director of a drug program, which we have a discipleship for men and women. And we minister in the jails. We own a construction company called Covenant Builders where we can disciple these men and then teach them a trade. I can honestly say that I am married to a man of God and very honored that God has chosen me to be his wife. He, um, he has the highest integrity of any man I know. He's honest, he's faithful. He cares selflessly about others. Um, he's just really a true picture of what Jesus is to me and my family and to the people around here. Today, it's not about wealth or fame or power. I am so rich, rich with his love, rich with his presence, rich in the things that a knowledge of truth that have set me free. The oracle, as you put your hand on it, would just move around. Well, my brother's a jokester, you know, I thought he's doing it, and he's con trying to convince me he's not doing this. Uh, what I did, uh, I took the Ouija board by myself up to my bedroom one night. But the Ouija board still answered his questions, and Jeff knew some other force was at work. It scared me, but at the same time, it was kind of like a roller coaster ride. You're scared to death, but you're thrilled. I began to recognize after this that there was a, uh, a presence that began to develop in my house. I mean, I would wake up in the middle of the night and literally feel someone's watching me. And I would wake up and, and literally walk through the house in order to experience that because I liked it. And normally a 
kid in third grade or second grade or whatever mm. wakes up and feels some presumably dark mm. presence in the room, doesn't want to get up and walk around the house at night alone right. to feel it or check it out. Right. Well, I, I based this experience on the fact that I knew that there was more. There was something. There was uh, the other side. Jeff was soon closer to the presence than he was to his own alcoholic father. I mean, I was just, I was unhappy as a, as a kid. I, I didn't want to be where I was. I didn't want to be in the family I was in. So I was looking for an escape. I was looking for literally the possibility of something else, anything else, because my life is, I'll be honest with you, it's hell. You know, I mean, here I am, the town drunk's kid, being abused, uh, being neglected. I, I didn't feel loved. Soon after his experience with the Ouija board, the presence Jeff felt in his home spoke to him. I woke up one night, um, and literally it was there was like a voice behind my, my ear saying, Jeff, come, you know, come here, I got something to show you. This strange force took Jeff on out-of-body experiences. During these times, he saw things days before he experienced them in real life. Then Jeff met a man who happened to be a practicing Satanist. He prayed over me and laid hands on me. And when he laid hands on me, I was filled with a demon. Jeff believed Satanism was the path to honing his paranormal abilities. And when a demon is around you or is inside of you, uh, the sensation or the sense of their presence you lie to yourself. You think that that's your power level. He and his new teacher formed their own coven and recruited other teens to join them. I saw each and every one of them become demon possessed. And I noticed something in my heart. My heart felt for them. It was like I was convicted. I knew it was wrong. It was like I knew this, this shouldn't be happening. I fought that because I'm a Satanist. I don't care about anybody or anything but me. I mean, here I am, a caring Satanist, you know? So I began to ritually try to kill this part of me that's alive, this heart, this, this part of me that, that cares. No matter what they tried, Jeff and the demonic forces inside him just couldn't kill that little seed of love and compassion. So the demons that had given him power for so many years turned on Jeff and tried to kill him instead. The demons inside of me literally began to uh, torment me. I mean, turned against me and, and, and against each other, sending me through hell. Jeff decided the only way to escape the torment was to kill himself. Got me a gun and went down to my motel and put the gun against my head. And when I looked down the barrel of that gun, the thought in my mind, where are you gonna spend eternity? came out of nowhere. I couldn't pull the trigger. The next day, Jeff tried to hang himself, but the rope slipped. He went to bed sobbing. Again, he heard a voice, but this time it was different. The voice came from, I mean, right here next to me and said, get out. And I knew it wasn't demonic. It was different. And what I did was I got out of bed and I didn't even think about walking through the house and going out the back door. I opened up my, my window and stepped out my window. And I'll be honest with you, when I stepped out my window, I was, I was in a completely different presence. And, and I knew it was God. There was this incredible presence of power, but love. I knew that that power that had been pursuing me, who wouldn't let me die, was present. Here is the love that you've always wanted, always needed, that you've always been searching for, and you went looking for it in the wrong place. Because you didn't have it, you turned to darkness. Now here it is. Well, I just looked up in the sky and I just said, Jesus, make my life okay. Though he had just given his life to Christ, Jeff still had to deal with the demons. He had been performing elaborate satanic rituals for years, but all it took to get rid of the demons was the simple prayer of a woman he met at church. And she just started praying, she Harry and myself, and she just started praying and the demons inside of me just, just came up and literally turned my head and I looked at her and she looked at the demons and she just said, in the name of Jesus, go. And they left. It was like that. 
and I ran to find a mirror and I looked at myself for the first time in four years because every day I shaved I saw the demons finally I'm free Jeff was soon able to get married in part because his need for love and acceptance had finally been met by God and every one of us are looking for someone somewhere to take care of us to love us we're all still children though our bodies age we have a Heavenly Father who's real who we have access to any time we want think about that what an awesome opportunity to be loved to be taken care of to be provided he'll never leave us or forsake it's almost it's almost too good to be true so we deny it don't deny it take him at his word allow him to be who he says he is don't tell him what to do don't try to manipulate him just be his child and let him provide and love for you he will This story started many years ago in a Baptist church in Bournemouth, England. One Sunday night, the pastor, Dr. Francis Dixon, asked a man named Peter to share his testimony. Peter got up and said, This is how I was saved. I was in the Royal Navy. I was walking down George Street in Sydney, Australia, and out of nowhere stepped a gentleman, and he said to me, Excuse me, sir, could I ask you a question? I hope that it won't offend you, but if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? The Bible says that it will either be in heaven or in hell. Would you think about that, please? Thank you. God bless you. Then the man left. I'd never been confronted with that question. I couldn't get it out of my mind. I got back to England, met someone who took me to a mission, and that's where I became a Christian. Some while later, they had a youth meeting in the same church in Bournemouth, and Noel, one of the visiting team, shared his testimony. This is how I came to know Jesus Christ. I was in the Royal Navy and my ship was stationed in Sydney. One evening I was walking down George Street when out of nowhere stepped a man. He said to me, young man, I have a question to ask you. If you should die tonight, where would you go? Would it be heaven or hell? Now don't try to evade the question. It must be one or the other. What he said bothered me for many months. I sought out a Christian. He helped me and I gave my life to Christ. My Baptists love testimonies like that. The Baptist pastor from England was now very puzzled. Not long afterwards, he was preaching in Adelaide, South Australia, when he decided to tell the story of Peter and Noel's separate encounters with the man in George Street. As he did so, a man jumped up excitedly and said, I'm another, I'm another. I was drawn to receive Christ the same way by the same man on George Street. This was Corporal Murray Wilkes, who had been in a hurry to catch his tram on George Street, when a voice behind him called, Hey, wait! Murray stopped and turned around. The stranger in front of him asked, Soldier, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? Would it be heaven or hell? I hope I'd go to heaven, replied Murray. Hoping isn't good enough, said the stranger. You can know. The stranger's question had exposed a raw nerve in Murray's life. Although he was a good living, church going, married man, he also knew he was a hypocrite and had never faced the question of eternal destiny. Two weeks later, Murray knelt in the army barracks and gave his life to Christ. Dr. Francis Dixon continued his tour, and when preaching in Perth, 
He once again shared the stories. Afterwards, a young man came up to him and told how he too had been in the Navy, had visited George Street, and had become a Christian after meeting the stranger with his compelling question. When Dr. Dixon finally arrived in Sydney, he was eager to find out more about this urban missionary, and he asked a Christian worker, Who's this man in George Street? I know him well. His name is Frank Jenner. Francis Dixon was taken to a humble little house where he was introduced to Frank Jenner. As Francis related the story of the four young servicemen who had come to know Christ through his simple question, Frank began to weep. I've never heard that anyone I'd spoken to had gone on for the Lord. Some made the decision when I talked to them at a Saturday night of witnessing and then came home for breakfast on a Sunday morning. Sometimes 30 people came home with me, but I never knew any more than that. Frank had carried on this work for 16 years, and this was the first time he'd heard of any lasting results. I would say he really had to be committed to show that sort of gratitude and love for Jesus, to do that for so many years and not hear of any results. Over the next few years, Francis Dixon preached around the world, and he told the story of Frank Jenner from time to time. In the UK, at an evangelical convention, where pastors came to him, saying they had been arrested by the stranger with his startling question. In India, at a missionary convention where an Indian man had come to Sydney on one visit and had been confronted by Frank's question. He had received Christ and eventually gone into Christian ministry. In Jamaica, at a missionary conference where a couple of missionaries had come to Jesus years before at Frank Jenner's witness. In the United States, at a naval chaplain's conference, he shared about the man of George Street and his witness. A chaplain stood and shared that he too had come to Christ as a result of Frank Jenner's arresting question. It's impossible to know how many lives were touched by that one-line sermon, but it's safe to say that Frank Jenner's legacy is measured in terms more lasting than simple numbers c can convey. Frank recounted his own journey of faith, which is every bit as remarkable as the lives of those he touched. Before I knew Jesus, he said, I lived the wild life of a sailor to the full and had become addicted to gambling. Then in 1937, I met my Savior for the first time and my life was transformed. The addiction to gambling gone forever. In gratitude for his second chance at life, he pledged to serve God to the best of his ability. He said, each day my aim was to speak to 10 people about Jesus, and I did so for 28 years until Parkinson's disease took its toll. In wartime and in peace, good times and bad, I continued with the work that I promised to do. It has been estimated that over the years Frank talked to more than 100,000 people, actually more than most pastors would address in their lifetime. In later years, Frank's health deteriorated, and during his last days, he prayed, Lord, please take me home on a Sunday night. His last request was granted. He died at a quarter to midnight, just at the end of a Sunday night. The next morning, a ray of sunlight shone through the open window. It fell upon his beloved well-worn Bible and the solitary rose resting on it. No one except a little group of Christians in Sydney knew Frank Jenner. But I tell you, his name was famous in heaven. Heaven knew him. And you can imagine the welcome he received when he went home to glory. Jesus said, If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Personally, I think Jesus confessed Frank's name very often to his Father in heaven. And conversely, Jesus said, If you don't confess me before men, I won't confess you before my Father in heaven. Actually, that's where it's best to be recognized, you know, in heaven, by your heavenly Father rather than on earth. Because that's where our reward is too. Personally, I don't think Frank Jenner's face would ever have been published on the cover of any prestigious Christian publication or his story carry more than a few paragraphs in a Christian magazine. But God has made sure that his story has been told to honor this man who honored Jesus so much. God bless you and empower you to be a bold and unembarrassed witness for Jesus Christ. I was seeking power. I was seeking something real because I wanted to see something that was tangible. I wanted to see something that was, was able to work in my life now. It was supernatural power Sean Patrick Williams wanted. He grew up attending church, but never saw a God of power working in his own life. At 14, Sean began using LSD. 
By 17, when his parents divorced, he was a drug addict living on the streets. At times, he blamed God for his world falling apart, and then he took a dangerous turn to the dark side. At that time, I just basically just cursed God, had these, these desires. I said, basically made a pact with Satan that if he'd you know, do these certain things for me, he could have my soul. Soon after his vow, Sean Patrick's life began to change. He became a drug dealer. Then he began to meet people that claimed to have the power he wanted. They worshiped Satan. You know, I started dating a girl that was into Wiccan religion. And through that process, I uh, had people that were you know, casting spells and you know, reading my tarot cards. His reputation as a drug dealer grew, and so did his obsession for power. I had already had a affiliate, drug affiliate with the Dixie Mafia, the Mexican Mafia, all different Hells Angels. I, you know, I was selling drugs, interaction with all these people. And so over time, uh, I became personal friends with people that were, you know, in um, a preacher in the Church of Satan. His lucrative drug deals helped him buy his own business, a bar. Soon, a successful nightclub owner approached Sean and asked him to become a business partner. The man guaranteed Sean millions in profits, but there was a catch. His business partner practiced Santeria, a form of Satanism involving animal sacrifice. As part of the deal, Sean Patrick was obliged to join. One evening at the man's nightclub, Sean was prepared to make that step. I knew what they were, they were getting me to the point to a ritual, to you know, the blood sacrifice and, and um, setting me up for this point. So. Here I am over, over this time period, um, I'm like intrigued about, I'm ready. I'm pretty much at the point where I, I, it's either I'm all the way in or I'm all the way out. And so they took me up into a DJ booth and there's about four or 500 people dancing there. And he says, now here I am, I'm, I'm high on ecstasy, I'm high on cocaine, I'm drinking. He turned around and, and as he turned around, he looked and he held his arms out, looked in my eyes and said, what do you think? It was then the man offered Sean riches in the business world if he would seal his deal with Satan with a blood sacrifice. But at that moment, Sean's mind cleared. The haze of drugs fell away, and he heard something he'd never heard before. And when he turns around like that, uh, a, a voice spoke into, to my spirit. It was like my consciousness. And it was just as plain as day. It said, heaven's real and hell's real, and you've got to make a choice. And for the first time in years, here I am standing under the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm convicted of sin. I'm clear in my mind. I'm not high. And I'm sitting here looking at him, and I'm thinking, how in the world did I get here? I said, oh, God, will you help me? At that moment, I said, God, I'm a drug addict, and I'm worthless here. But if you'll take my life, I'll give it to you, and I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to. As soon as the door opened up, God got me out of there, and I never came back. I never tried to call him again. Until nine months later, I found out the bar had shut down. Sean also kicked his drug habit and amazingly never experienced withdrawal symptoms. The power of the Holy Spirit to bring me through deliverance from no DTs, no relapses, to make those desires go away, there's power in that. I tried to do it three or four times on my own. I couldn't. While Sean Patrick's initial turn from evil was immediate, a spiritual battle in his home lasted for nine more months. I had things happen like my bed levitating off the ground and I'm scared, I'm scared, you know, hiding under the sheets and, I, and I'm never experiencing anything like this. But I finally got so sick of being scared that I just got up out of my bed and I said, you know what, you fine, go ahead and kill me. I'm gonna live for Jesus and I'm gonna be in heaven and you gotta go and you gotta leave in the name of Jesus. The demonic activity in his home vanished that night. Sean Patrick began to read the Bible constantly. I wasn't grounded in a good church at that moment yet, and I was just had my Bible. I was resting, I would find a scripture and I would rest in it and I would just stand on the scripture. Sean was still running a bar, so he read his Bible at work. I'd lay it out on the bar and in between serving customers, man, I would just have it out there. And so I would read the scripture and, and just wait on the customers. And it was the only thing that would keep those desires from over, overtaking my mind. Finally, he sold the bar. And after two and a half years of praying and searching, Sean met and married Christy. I thank God for my wife and my children and to be able to live and serve him and to be able to know him and his presence and in the person of Christ. Christy says her husband's reliance on the Bible is the key to his happy and successful life. He always um, 
brings brings situations back to the Word of God, and we are we are founded on the Word. Our family's founded on the Word. It's 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 the the true north in our life. Now. He says he's found the ultimate power in Jesus Christ. When I met him and when I gave my life to him and had my, my encounter with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus, um, that was power. The things that he showed me was that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask or think because that's his nature, you know, he's, he's power. We're going to feature a testimony by a man of God named Mickey Robinson. You're going to be absolutely amazed when you hear this story because he was in a plane crash that, that literally destroyed him. In fact, it killed him. And yet he's alive to tell the tale. Hold on to your seat, seats right now and listen to this amazing, outstanding testimony of the goodness of God. I'd never met anybody who ever told me about anything personally, knowing God or anything supernatural other than historically what I knew from stories from the Bible. Um, never met one person who told me they had a real relationship with Jesus. Never knew about um, the need to really come into a relationship with, with the Lord through Jesus. And uh, I was busy getting it on. But you know, there's not enough excitement in the world to ever satisfy. You always got to have more. And I like stuff that was edgy, you know, invent, you know skiing and, and I always liked aviation stuff. And so I started taking flying lessons and I, I thought it'd be more fun jumping out of airplanes so I became a sport parachutist and that really got me I mean I became obsessed with skydiving it really consumed my life my existence uh, revolved around that 30 to 60 seconds in free fall and that five minute parachute ride then I had to do it again it's like mm -hmm. like a drug you know it's like good oh totally and then all of a sudden one night all that was going to change shortly after takeoff I don't really recall much because I was kind of dozing off uh, sitting next to the pilot or actually sitting on the floor next to the pilot where we removed the seats in this new aircraft and I was awakened by a sound unfamiliar to me it was the sound of the motor going completely silent uh -oh. and the pilot turned to me and he slapped me he says that's it we're going down so we just pitched forward and we're, wow. we plummeted straight down at over 100 miles an hour and what was seen out of the cockpit and this was told to me I don't recall this but we were going straight to the ground and we're headed right towards a gigantic oak tree we did hit that tree going like I said over 100 miles an hour and my face stopped my body going 100 miles an hour so wow. I uh, then the airplane cartwheel on its wings and slammed into the ground if you see pictures of the aircraft it doesn't look like anybody could survive this so there was obviously injury and confusion and the two students got pushed out the doorway and by one of my friends who was a very experienced jumper and the fourth man out saw me moving in the pot and assumed we were leaving too and just as he was going out the plane went up in flames and as he was running away he heard screaming and realized I was trapped inside along with the pilot and this brave man who was my friend and I went back in the plane and saw me trying to jump at, escape where the wing had been torn loose from mm -hmm. the airplane but I was stuck and by something on my, my uh, equipment or my mm -hmm. clothing it was caught and I was soaked with fuel and it was on fire oh, from head to toe wow. and just like you see in movies a person whose whole body was engulfed in flames and, and this is where God did the first miracle this man grabbed a hold of my parachute harness and with his bare hands tore that loose it's 2,000 pounds tensile strength in each one of those straps wow. pulled so hard he pulled his thumbs out of his sockets dragged me away from the plane and slapped the fire out it kept reigniting and then he tried to go back for the pilot and he couldn't he was burned alive well they rushed me off to the hospital obviously it was horrible and uh, um, they rushed me off to the hospital and saw that I sustained very serious injuries I had a brain injury I had burns over a large portion of my body I had to find out my eye was blind my right eye was blind uh, and you know tremendous cuts and you know the shock of you know that crash they told my family I was going to die they told my sister to come that day because I was not going to be there in the afternoon I had an experience I had never heard about never heard anything like this uh, um, as I was laying there in that condition just racked with pain and, mm -hmm. and discomfort in every way possible suddenly my my inner man the real me my spirit sat up out of my body and I could feel my legs go through the springs of the bed wow. and my spirit came out of my body as if you would take a glove off your hand and instantly I was in a spiritual world instantaneously I knew this was the real world and this man that I was seeing was the real me no when that happened were you aware of any pain still or no I was totally com com no. completely separated from the pain in the carcass completely that no and I didn't even remember I turned around looking I mean I was mm -hmm. I was transferred immediately into a spiritual dimension mm -hmm. and everything about the spirit world 
is more real than this world. Mm -hmm. The colors are mm -hmm. brighter, the edges of everything are sharper, the emotions are, are just High enhanced, hand. they are clear. And instantaneously, the thing that, that really struck me the most was there was a complete absence of the awareness of time. Everything in this world is relative to time. You know, you mm -hmm. got up this morning, you'll go to bed at night, something is old, uh, something is new, it will get, get old, something is born, it will die. Everything in this plane, in the physical plane, in the natural plane, is relative mm -hmm. to time. But everything in the spiritual plane is relative to eternity. So what had been natural to be aware of time right. was totally gone. And I was totally aware of eternity. It is shocking. It is stunning to be, to be conscious and to know what eternity is. Also, logic and reasoning doesn't happen there. You know, based on the sum total of all my intelligent thoughts that I've learned, you know, I've, I've had a death and I'm in the spirit world. It's like you just know that you know that you know. You just, it's like having a revelation constantly. And that's, it was incredible. And I, was, I, was, I knew I was traveling. I could feel mm -hmm. you know, that I was traveling. And as I looked ahead, there was this pure white light. It was whiter than the whitest snow and brighter than 10,000 suns. And yet I could look right at it, and it was compelling. And it was like I was being, being towed. I was, I was being towed yeah. like a tractor being. And, and as I was looking, I could, I could feel this anticipation. Uh. But then simultaneously that, on my right side, I could feel something, and I looked, and there was this blackness sweeping. Now this blackness, as I looked at it, instantly I was aware of its complete nature. It was eternal, like I was experiencing eternity. It was without any matter. It was without any life. It was void. And it was forever non-negotiable, cut off from the source of all life. And the more that I looked at it, the faster it would sweep. And the faster, and the more that that occurred, the more intense the feeling of the nature of being cut off and sealed oh, forever whoa. and separated it is hor Horrifying. horrific. Yeah. Horrific. You would not. I used to never be able to stand to be near anybody who could say go to hell after that, because you wouldn't want the worst person. No. You wouldn't want Adolf Hitler, Ben Laden, Saddam. You wouldn't want any human being to ever go in there. It was wow. so horrible. And as that was sweeping, it got down to it was eclipsing this light. So there was just a, it was like you're in a room and you close the door, a dark room, and there's a little space between the door and the door jam. It wasn't a doorway. It was really, this is a real place that I was seeing and that I was feeling. And as it was closing, it was eclipsing. And now I'm standing on the very edge, the precipice of eternal separation. And I scream out of my spirit, I'm sorry, I want to live. Give me another chance. And, and just before that was to close, I was standing in the presence of Almighty God. Ooh. And instantly I knew I would never die for eternity. And that's I mean, mercy. it's unbelievable. Wow. And instantly I knew that this being who off, was off on, on this side of me, uh, who I didn't see, but I was standing in this river of golden radiation. It looked like a moving river of golden light. And this river went that way. It went that way. It was underneath me. It was going right through me. And this river was alive. I don't know how I'd describe it. He said that this, ri the river, of life, that this right? river was alive. And, I was, and it's going right through me. And I'm, I'm more alive than anybody can imagine. I mean, this is the height of the experience of life. It filled up with life. And, I, and somehow I knew this being was going to take care of me for eternity. I didn't see the New Jerusalem. I didn't see any angels in heaven. I didn't see any people who had gone before me. This was the max. So I was so filled with, it. It was just the, the love and the, all of God's majesty, all of his authority, all of his love, everything was just flowing through me. I was like vibrating like a tuning yeah. fork, the very essence of, of God's nature. But when God spoke to me, and not in a language like you and I are talking now, but the knowledge of his purpose, the word of his purpose, came in through that same light. And I was, I was taken back to the same way. I was like being reeled in like a kite and I went down through space and time, this dimension. As my spirit settled into my body and I could start to hear out of these ears and see out of this eye, I came to in the room, materialized, kind of like they beam up on Star Trek. Right. And I heard myself speaking in this beautiful language that I had known, never heard anybody talk about before. The heavenly language. Yeah, it was a beautiful language. And when my brain turned on, I thought, what in the heck is this other language? And I was no longer uh, the person who was dying and dead was no was no longer, and I was born again and filled with the Holy Holy Ghost. I never heard about that. You know, for years I wondered what was that blackness and why did it sweep down to where it was just a sliver, like about a half inch of white light. And years later, God revealed it to me. It was really a historical record of my life that for all the years that I had lived, I was in darkness, and God gave me a space to cry out to Him. And in that space, it changed my future, my destiny, my whole purpose. I was, God loved me the whole time. God was with me. But, you know, don't let, please, don't wait 
until you're that desperate. We're desperate right now, and He's He's with you, and He, you know, you have a chance today to cry out to God. It's not complicated. It's not religious. I mean, certainly my prayer wasn't all that complicated, and it wasn't about religion. It was about I needed life, and there is no one of us before God that doesn't need the whole life that He has to offer. It's usually fear that keeps us from doing that, or or, or like we're afraid. Well, I'm not good enough. That's the whole deal. We need God. February 28th. It happened in the middle of winter, February 28th, 1999. Believers had gathered for a week of revival meetings at the Anglican Church. Hungry for God and troubled by new reports of community drug use, they decided to add a special Sunday afternoon youth service. Among those leading the meeting were Pastor Moses Kayak and his ministerial colleagues Joshua and James Ariak. All great grandsons of the original lightkeeper, Angwatizawak. An invitation was offered for youth who felt they wanted to come closer to God. Worship leader Louis Ariak was praying over the youth that had gathered around the altar. I felt so close to God, and he kept giving me this verse that says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Something start to happen that uh, was out of our control. This noise started coming. Yeah, it started softly, like you can barely hear it. A dual cassette deck used to record the service was still running off the soundboard. Right away, I wanted to stop, but it kept getting louder, and, and I started to notice that people were kind of getting a little nervous. It was so loud that everything started to shake. Fire went right through me. It sounded like a jet. Things started to shake. I started to shake. I told myself, there's no jets in Pondinwood. After this extraordinary visitation, it was evident the moment still had power. Every time I thought about it, I, I was uh, greatly humble. Uh, thinking, thinking that uh, the Almighty God can visit us. When Pastor Moses Kayak first heard the low-pitched rumbling, he walked over to the church soundboard to adjust the settings. I tried this, not stop, tried this, no stop. When these efforts failed to correct the situation, he quickly turned down the master control. When this too failed, he shut the system off completely. Still, the sound and the recording continued. It shouldn't have been recorded. It's only by the miracle of God. Came into the town. He was completely humble to the point where he wanted to continually come before God, kneel, and ask for prayer, and ask for the cleansing of the heart to become pure before him. I'll tell you, friend, the origin of revival rests not in man, but rests in God the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God alone can originate revival. We need to invite the Spirit of God back into the church. We need to invite the Spirit of God back into our lives. The Church of Jesus Christ is largely sleeping, it's like a great bedroom, and you have all the Christians in bed, and they're all sleeping, and they're saying, please don't wake me up. I want to sleep off 
And of course, when God starts to operate a revival, people cannot sleep. You can't sleep in church when the Spirit of God awakes the people. Look at the first verse of this 52nd chapter. Awake! Awake! Put on strength! Wake it up, you sleepy Christian! Awake, all that sleepest! Arise from the dead! Christ will give you life! a person embrace death with Christ? Why should a person be willing to go in identification down to the cross and into the tomb and up again? I'll tell you why. Because it's the only way that God can get glory out of a human being. When God stepped down, suddenly, men and women all over the parish were gripped by the fear of God. The Holy Spirit began to move among the people. What was that? Revival? Revival? Not an evangelist? Not a special effort? Not anything at all organized on the basis of human endeavor. But an awareness of God that gripped the whole community, so much so that work stopped, and uh, the minister writing about what happened in the following morning said this, you met God on Meadow and Moorland, you met him in the homes of the people, God seemed to be everywhere, the praying and the meetings continued for several months, until one night, a very remarkable thing happened. There, kneeling among straw in the barn, when suddenly one young man rose and read part of Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of God? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart to have not lifted up his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord. And he shut his Bible and then looking down at the minister and at the other men who were kneeling there, he began to pray, God are my hands clean, is my heart pure? And that dear man got no further. He fell on his knees and then on his face among the straw. And he prayed, prayed, and prayed again. I'm standing beside him for about five minutes. And then the door of the church opened and the session clerk came in. Mr. Campbell, something wonderful has happened. Revival has broken out. Will you come to the door and see the crowd of see it? Eleven o'clock, Matthew, eleven o'clock. And I went to the door and there must have been a congregation of between six and seven hundred people gathered round the church. And in the midst of it, I could hear the cry of the penitent. I could hear men crying to God for mercy. And within a matter of minutes, the church was crowded at a quarter to twelve. Now, where did the people come from? How did they know that a meeting was in progress in the church? Well, I cannot tell you. But I know this, that from village and hamlet, the people came. Were you to ask some of them today, what was it that moved you? They couldn't tell you. Only that they were moved by a power that they could not explain. And the power was such as to get them to understand and see that they were hell deserving sinners. And of course, the only place they could think of where they might find help was at the church. When I endeavored to get up into the pulpit, I found the way blocked with young people who had been at the dance. When I went into the pulpit, I found a young woman, a graduate of Aberdeen University, who was at the dance. And she's lying on the floor of the pulpit, crying, Is there mercy for me? 
so dead as a dead prayer meeting. There's nothing more alive than a live prayer meeting. You ought to feel life in your soul then get into an old-fashioned white-hot prayer meeting where men are praying and they're not stringing sentences together and they're not saying the old things that you're sick hearing in prayer meetings. Oh no, they're praying. They're pleading with God. They're crying to God. Sometimes it's a groan. Sometimes it's a tear. Sometimes it's a broken sentence. Sometimes it's a sigh. But it's prayer. All true passion is born out of anguish. All true passion for Christ comes out of a baptism of anguish. Folks, let me tell you something. Out of this baptism of anguish comes a marvelous thing that happens to those willing to submit to it. Marvelous thing. It's the instant prompt knowing of God's voice. Instant. Now see, if you don't have a history of prayer, if you don't have this willingness to share God's heart, you get it by asking Him for it. He said, I'll, I'll give. I'm more willing to give you our to receive. This is something you ask. Oh God, I, I, I want to step out now and I want to know your heart. I'm going to say to you, dear friend, if you're out here without Christ, you come to Jesus Christ and serve Him as long as you live, whether you go to hell at the end of the way, because He's worthy. I say to you, Christian friend, you come to the cross and join Him in union and death and enter into all the meaning of death to hell in order that He can have glory. There are numbers among us that are changing, and they don't know it. You've lost your fight. That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it. So you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. What is thunder and lightning? Well, according to the psalmist and according to the Bible everywhere, thunder and lightning are but a kind of indication of God's power. The God who said at the beginning, let there be light, and there was light. Well, now, he just gives you an indication of what his power is in the flash of the lightning, the roar of the thunder. These are but glimpses of God's might, God's power, God's eternal ability. Very well. A revival, I say, is just a kind of touch of his God, a fleeting glimpse of something of what he is in and of himself. And I'm emphasizing this, my dear friends, because you and I must come to realize that these things are possible and these things are meant for us. We were never meant to be content with a little. We were never meant to be content with a little.
Oh